very warm welcome to Climate Perspectives. My name is Matt Stadlin and I'm thrilled that my guest today is Chris Skidmore. He's been a Conservative MP since 2010. And critically, in 2019, when he was Energy and Clean Growth Minister, he was the man who signed into law our commitment, the UK's commitment, binding commitment, to reaching net zero emissions by 2050. Then in 2022, in the autumn of last year, he began work on what would become known as Mission Zero Review or the Skidmore Review. It's a net zero review. And his task was to work out how we can reach our net zero targets in a pro-business, pro-enterprise, pro-growth manner. In other words, affordably and efficiently. He's a, a massive champion for taking on climate change. And I'm really pleased that he's with us to talk through some of the issues that have emerged from his report and to get his sense of exactly where we are both as a country and as a world in tackling the climate crisis. So Chris, thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much. Looking forward to the conversation. I want to begin, if I may, by just asking you to sum up for those who haven't had a chance to look in any detail at your report, what your principal conclusions were. So uh, the Net Zero Review that I chaired uh, produced a 340 page uh, final report uh, called Mission uh, Zero. Uh, and the report was uh, in two parts, really. Uh, the first part, uh, which I think is incredibly important, was about creating a new narrative for Net Zero, saying that Net Zero is not just uh, an environmental policy tool uh, designed to tackle the climate crisis, uh, essential though that is. It's actually then the principal economic opportunity uh, that presents this country uh, for this decade, potentially even longer. Uh, and that the opportunity uh, of inward investment into this country must be seized if we're going to remain you know, a competitive uh, economy. Uh, we've seen a paradigm shift uh, with 90% of the world's GDP now under a net zero uh, target. And we need to recognise that there is no economy of the future without a green economy. Uh, the second part of the report was to not review net zero, but rather to ask how can we ensure that when we look at those commitments that have been made by the UK, not just on net zero, importantly on reducing our emissions by 2030, the national determined contribution of 73% emissions reduction, but also some of those mandates around electric vehicles, you know, no new uh, petrol or diesel cars by 2030, uh, boilers, no new gas boilers by 2030, 2035, uh, a number of other commitments that have been made, a net zero power grid by 2035. How can we ensure that we're going to be able to deliver on these commitments and not uh, fall by the wayside? And the report set out 129 recommendations uh, for the government. I can go into further detail later about sort of what those included uh, on what they can do now uh, to move further, faster, to make sure we can stay on track for net zero. But importantly, it set out 10 10 year missions because one of the big recommendations of the report was if we want to deliver on net zero, if we want to make uh, as able to scale up uh, the technologies that we need, if we want to be able to build out new net zero industries, We've got to make the long term programmatic commitment uh, of certainty, clarity, sort of consistency and continuity of policy uh, judgment. Uh, and so setting out these missions was a key part of the Mission Zero uh, report. And uh, in terms of uh, yeah, its uh, reception, it seems to have been very well received by all sectors in identifying not just what are the challenges, but what are those opportunities the Net Zero can present. So you did the work on this review, on this report, after you'd left government. And I wonder how you feel the Conservative government has received what you've discovered, what you've learned, what, what you've found. Have you been encouraged by the government's response so far? You know, it's a government that you left not that very long, long ago. And how much trust do you think we should have in this particular government under Rishi Sunak moving forward, that they really 
grasp this, that they really get it, that they understand both the importance of reaching our targets, but also the opportunities that you outline. So I've, I've been out of government now for about three and a half years, and I've spent a lot of time trying to build cross-party uh, consensus as chair of the all-party group uh, on the environment. Um, and I took on this uh, chairmanship of the Net Zero Review as an independent chair. So I met with all political parties. And it's critical for me that the report is not just about making recommendations to this government. I want whoever forms the next government uh, to be able to see the recommendations in this report as for the long term. We won't be able to deliver on net zero or tackling climate change unless we build cross party consensus. It's too precious uh, to uh, bring party politics uh, into the equation. And, and it's always been the case. The Climate Change Act that set up our carbon budget frameworks that ultimately led to net zero was delivered by uh, both a, a coalition of Labour and Conservative governments. So in, in a way, I sort of feel very strongly that it's important that sort of party politics is put aside. Otherwise, you know, we will end up not actually delivering what we promised. And, and business and industry need long term certainty. They can't just expect one political party to sort of undo what another one has done. But that said, obviously, there is a year and a bit left of uh, this current administration before general election. So there are things that this government can do now. Uh, and I was keen to identify that in the report. So I created a sort of 25 policy recommendations by 2025. that The government could definitely sort of achieve in legislation you know, ahead of the next general election. I made 77 of the 129 recommendations ones that the government should take forward action on now, if not necessarily complete, because that's the other challenge is you're never going to be able to deliver certain recommendations uh, within a single year. Sometimes this is about thinking about a long term process and, and taking that strategic vision, but committing to it nonetheless. Uh, and so the government's sort of response, I sort of felt yeah, it was, was relatively positive. They agreed to 23 out of the 25 immediate recommendations. By my own count, they agreed to about 70 of the 129 recommendations and an additional 30 that they wouldn't put a time frame to. They, they flat out refused about 29 recommendations. So the challenge was some of those 29 recommendations are quite important ones. Uh, so, so there is a sort of question mark over the government has now set up a new office uh, for energy security and net zero. Uh, it's redoubled its commitments to a number of uh, areas of green technology on the back of our so-called Green Day uh, that was uh, set out in March. And now we have the Energy Security Bill, which is going to be the piece of legislation for this parliament that uh, will provide an opportunity to put down uh, amendments, uh, which I will be doing. Uh, so there is the here and now. There is the present. There is what the government is doing now. But there's very much that sort of longer term perspective about building cross party uh, coalitions of support. And I want to ensure that every political party has net zero front and centre of their manifestos uh, for the next general election in 2024. So just sticking with this government for the moment, the, the winners of the next election are very much up in the air, as we all know. It's not an easy election to predict. Very few elections in this country are these days. Just dealing with this government, the government, as you say, that you left a few years ago, Given that they have rejected some of your proposals and that you've just said that some of those proposals are important, how confident can we be that under this government we are moving in the right direction? Because if those proposals, then we don't have time to go into the details of what they've rejected, but if those proposals, as you say, are important, that they have said no to, could that mean that actually the response to your report has been quite substantially inadequate? No, I think if you'd asked me back when I first took the chairmanship, the, the government would take forward around about 100 of the 129 recommendations. You know, I would have accepted that as being a positive uh, result. Uh, I think that the challenge is obviously with everything in, in climate change, you always want to go as far as fast as you can. You know, we've got a sense of urgency that we need to achieve. But that's also balancing you know, sectors that recognise you know, what is or what is not possible. Uh, so there is obviously you know, areas where I will continue to, to, to focus on pushing for further action faster, not least on, on areas around methane and having a methane flaring ban in the North Sea. But ultimately, 
you know, I think things are going in the right direction. You know, we still have de decarbonized further faster than any other industrialized nation in the UK. Uh, and at the same time, we are moving in the right direction. You know, we're seeing a moratorium of onshore wind being lifted. We've seen a, a reintroduction of a ban on fracking, uh, things that sort of potentially were up in the air, you know, nine months ago. Uh, we've now seen a movement towards it in the right direction. So, so I sort of feel that you know the, the government is is taking forwards uh, measures that are the right ones. Uh, it's just a case of like, can we raise that ambition? And, and that's what I'm keen to do uh, in the opportunities I get uh, with the current energy security bill. Something to be positive about, I, I suppose, is the fact that in the first three months of this year, in the first three months of 2023, we've just learned today, hot off the press, that for the first time, the main supplier of energy in this country has come from wind. Against that is the idea that there will be new gas and oil fields in the United Kingdom. How worried should we be about that? I think the question around the oil fields and whether licensing is granted is obviously a very worrying one. Um, I have publicly come out against new oil and gas licensing. Um, obviously, we recognise there is a role for oil and gas on the transition. You know, that's perfectly understandable and, and part of the balanced pathway set out by the Committee on Climate Change. But what is not part of that pathway is new oil fields. And that in particular creates a question mark around future UK climate leadership. Um, it's a question, obviously, that is also uh, one that the US has to answer with Joe Biden approving a, an oil drilling in, in Alaska. But it's very difficult for us to be able to demonstrate how we can all make the transition away from oil, uh, which needs to happen with new technological advances. And it will happen by opening new wells that won't be operational for at least 10 years and will then continue to extract up to 500 million barrels of oil uh, well beyond uh, 20 50. So you know, the, the question now is, if we're serious about the transition, you do need to set yourself an end date by which you start to recognise no new oil and gas needs to happen. Many of the people that you'll be talking to that will be reached by our conversation, Chris, will be converts to the idea that this is really urgent and that we really do need to do something about it. And also there's a great economic advantage in grasping this, as you've said, but there are, although perhaps not so many people who would identify these days as climate change deniers, that group perhaps has refined itself into anti-net zero campaigners. And I wonder what your, what your message to them might be. People who think that net zero is going to make us poorer, that disadvantaged people, people already disadvantaged in our society will be further disadvantaged, that this is a luxury that we can't afford or that there's no point in us doing it because China isn't doing enough, that sort of argument. What's your message to people who either genuinely or for ideological reasons put this stuff out there? I mean, I think it's the same as any transition, is that you can either face the future and recognise that this is the future. You can't go backwards. Um, nobody, you know, so when it came to any other transition, it's the sort of people who potentially we're against using emails or the internet or mobile phones. It's, it's here to stay. And, and it's recognizing that there is now a, a net zero race globally and, and other countries are committing to this. And uh, it's not possible to get private investment now unless you're willing to commit to decarbonization. And obviously those private sector organizations in boardrooms across the country are now making decisions on whether companies are prepared to go net zero or not. And so the risk is there are two pathways. There's the net zero pathway by which the UK can seize a slice of that opportunity to grow its economy in the industries of the future. Or there's the not zero pathway where we look backwards and say, we're just going to stand still while everyone overtakes us. Uh, and that is the real and clear and present net zero danger that it is going to uh, potentially uh, leave many companies isolated. And that's what I worry about is p companies and communities being left behind, not by net zero, but by not zero. Uh, and understanding also 
the, the benefits that net zero presents are ones that we should all agree with anyway, whether those are around having warmer homes with all the increase in health benefits, low, uh, lower emissions uh, and air pollutions in cities. It's hard to understand why you would be pro air pollution and pro cold, uh, damp homes when we recognize that this is something that needs to happen. And it's happened in the past. I mean, you know, we sort of I'm staring at you in front of a computer screen on the Internet that wasn't there 20 years ago. I'm you know, electricity you know, didn't exist at one point. Central heating and gas boilers didn't exist at one point. There is always going to be change. And sometimes you need to change to stay s- the same in, the, in, in, in life. Um, and I still feel passionately that now we are now in this international global race. The UK should continue to lead because the cost of following is always greater. Can you envisage a world, and I'm not talking here about what you what you want, what we want, but can you envisage a world, Chris, in which our children or our grandchildren really are living in net zero conditions? Or do you think that that's simply not realistic because of the feet dragging of not that not perhaps certain voices or interests within our own country, but I'm talking about whole countries globally. Will we ever get there as a world, do you think? And will we get there soon enough, if you think we will get there, to have a really very serious climate catastrophe? So I think there are two separate questions, uh, sadly. Uh, The first being that I am incredibly positive uh, that we will uh, achieve a a net zero world uh, and that the commitments that have been made globally, even though... You know, some countries are growing and will reach peak emissions before reducing. And we've got to recognise that every country is on a different journey. Those commitments towards renewable and clean power are enormous. We're on exponential curves upwards in every technology now. And to see the rate and pace of change is quite remarkable. We're living through revolutionary times. And I don't say that lightly. And even if there are countries still using coal, their commitments to phase out coal to then move to renewables are commitments that are there for the long term. Uh, and particularly now the states has made this sort of commitment through the Inflation Reduction Act. We're going to see a catalytic opportunities for technologies to take off globally. That said, we've got to recognise, and this is where we need potentially further work in the same way that we created a net zero target around which everyone's been able to work towards setting out a long-term destination of travel 1.5 degrees is already here potentially we're in a warming scenario of two degrees um climate change is is, has already happened uh it's not like net zero is suddenly going to turn the clock back it won't it will take centuries potentially for that to happen that's why net zero is so important to happen now because we've got to be able to guard against future warming uh, over sort of periods of time that are into the distant future. Carbon dioxide you know, has a life cycle of 300 years. So recognizing that we have to adapt and that it's not enough simply to go net zero is really critical. You know, sea levels will rise. We're already seeing potential uh, migration pattern shifts around desertification. Uh, we're seeing increasing in storm surges. All this will continue to happen. And so therefore, we need to think closely about what is the net zero equivalent of adaptation, where we can focus more of investment in building out resilient communities, resilient infrastructures, particularly resilient energy grids, recognising that climate change and its consequences uh, are going to be a reality for the future. When you say 1.5 is already here, do you mean literally we are, we've already hit the 1.5 degree of warming target that we were supposed to be limiting climate change to? I think we're, I mean, we're on the, we're already on the 1.5 degree pathway uh, earlier than potentially 2050. I think we're on a 1.2 degree warming scenario today. Uh, potentially 1.5 degrees is here by 2030. Uh, that window to to maintain 1.5 degrees is vanishingly small. And obviously, we're currently on a three degree uh, trajectory. Uh, So in between 1.5 degrees and three degrees, uh, those consequences will be dependent on the actions that are taken now in the next five years. And that's why it's so important to think of net zero, not by 2050. It is by halving our global emissions by 2030 
that we need to maintain our focus on. And that really does emphasise, doesn't it, the urgency, as you say. I'm, I'm just interested to know, because you've mentioned the word adaptation, in a division of resources, both in the United Kingdom, but also around the world, have you got any sense of how we should be dividing those resources up? So should it be 50% still, should it be 50% mitigation? Should it be 50% adaptation? Or should we still be, should, should we be much more emphasising mitigation rather than adaptation at this stage? So I think historically, there was a fear that by even talking about adaptation, you were somehow claiming that you were going to be sort of putting off mitigation, that somehow you would need to tell people, look, you're going to have to move. We need to make the changes now. And that was somehow a either or. It's not. It's it's both and. Uh, and, and the critical challenge is obviously to recognise where potential inevitabilities are going to occur, but also the probabilities, the unknowable events that are becoming more knowable now. Uh, and I think we're in a place where we have the data uh, and the meteorological data to understand the, the once in a hundred year uh, weather occurrences that are now becoming once every 10 years or once every sort of three years that we've got to be able that when we look at even looking at mitigation that we build in ad adaptation to our mitigation processes. And that was a you know, key part of the net zero review was it's not simply good enough to be thinking about what we need to do to mitigate climate change. We've got to be planning ahead when it comes to our infrastructure for the grid, when it comes to future land use, to think about how to reduce our carbon dioxide emissions, not just in a scenario for this year, but also in a warming scenario. So thinking these things through uh, is really important because, for instance, you know, we just start planting trees and then we find that they go up in smoke in wildfires. You know, that's not going to have helped the longer term sort of addressing the challenge of, of saving carbon dioxide for the future. You're a politician, Chris, and you're stepping down as an MP at the next election, as I understand it. Clearly, there's a need for leadership, again, both in our country, but also around the world, that this sort of scale of change needs to be sold to voters. It needs to be explained to people, doesn't it? And I wonder whether you, where you feel the tone should be. Should this be positive? Should this be about opportunity? Or should this also be, at least in part, about warning? Because sometimes the fact that we're having to make difficult choices or the fact that we're, ha we're having to scale back and, in certain ways that we might not want to, the fact that we're going to have to undergo something unpleasant, that doesn't mean that it's not necessary. It's just if we don't do that, the alternative is even worse. So where there are tough choices or might be tough choices to be made, how, how do you get people on board with that sufficiently quickly? The key point here is that obviously you know, everyone wants to do everything now all of the time, uh, to quote Antonio Guterres from the United Nations. But at the same time, politics and wider societal change is about priorities uh, and understanding those priorities around what will make the greatest difference now to, to, to bending that arc of emissions it, it is really important because sometimes I find that when it comes to net zero, everyone wants to move straight away towards telling people what to do, telling people that they have to change their lifestyles. And that is potentially the worst uh, way in which you go about achieving net zero. We need to be able to have a whole of society approach to net zero that recognizes people as individuals and but also as members of communities will be making decisions daily over their their lives and they have those decisions that are being made uh because of their families because of their jobs you know people have lives to lead and we've got to work with the grain of, of, of human behavior and not uh, against it that said you know the biggest changes we need to make now are focusing on systems-based approaches so De decarbonizing our electricity supply is the number one sort of priority, focusing on the deployment of renewable and clean power as a result and moving away from gas and fossil fuels, recognizing that no new oil and gas means that we need to innovate around new forms of hydrocarbons or renewable hydrocarbons to get us you know, off oil and gas and the use of plastics and chemicals. You know, all that innovation still needs to happen. When it comes to looking at aviation, 
focusing on the planes that are in the sky now and introducing sustainable aviation fuel that could be one of the biggest ways by which we can decarbonize flight looking at energy demand in homes and recognizing the homes that we are sitting in today are the homes that will still be there in 2050 and we've got to be able to reduce our demand on energy uh, through insulation through the installation electrification of heat you know, these are the priorities that we need to focus on i think sometimes when it comes to net zero every everyone wants to sit, you know, do everything all at once and that simply isn't possible you've got to be realistic and focus you know where we need to move the dial as fast as possible and have laser-like discipline about achieving that and it also i i assume it requires politicians to look beyond the next election cycle because election cycles can be incredibly narrow in the impact they might have on 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 working towards longer term but very very necessary goals absolutely and this was one of the key recommendations uh, in the net zero review was a, it was taking that long term approach it's one of the recommendations around investment cycles that i've called for breaking out of the spending review cycle that obviously means that no sort of government is willing to commit to uh investment projects uh to particular funds uh beyond a specific date uh, set by the Treasury. And if we need to have that ability, both particularly for industry and companies that take long lead time decisions around building you know, factories uh, and plants for the future, that they know that the government, whoever is the government, is, is going to stand square behind them, that none of the work is going to be unpicked. Uh, and yeah, the Treasury said they're going to look at doing this potentially. Uh, and we've got the autumn statement where they're going to come forward with new fiscal measures to match the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States. So we'll see what happens. But the government's committed £20 billion over 20 years to carbon dioxide utilisation storage in the clusters, uh, the industrial clusters that are looking at CCUS. So so there is hope, I think, that they're, they're beginning to to look at how to take a more long-term perspective uh, in the future. I want to finish by re- by coming back to where we started and, and just summing up that report again with some key bullet points so that people, that that's really fresh in people's mind when they leave this conversation. But just, just penultimately, on a personal level, what was it that got you about climate change? What was it that got you on side that, that made you think, crikey, this is really important and that I, Chris Skidmore, might be able to make some sort of difference here? Well, it's a good question. Um, I think I've just become increasingly uh, aware of, of the science uh, and I'm trying to think if there was a particular moment that I thought, yeah, this would be, this is here and this is now. Um, I think... I can't quite remember any sort of one eureka moment, but I think maybe it was more about recognizing that it would be possible. If I'm honest with you, that I think that's probably for myself uh, a bigger driver is that in the past I might have felt climate change is here, but we've had 30 years of COPs and every leader's turned up every year and every year emissions have increased. And, 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 then, and Copenhagen, people wouldn't agree on what to achieve. Actually, the sort of net zero and the the sort of Paris Agreement sort of itself provided a a sense of direction that hadn't been there in the past. But I think it was actually looking at some data that showed that the UK had had reduced its emissions by 40 percent and had done so actually by moving from coal to gas. So recognising actually that you need the transition and sometimes even if it's from one fossil fuel to another, that carbon dioxide emissions, you know, this is possible. And I think for me, recognising statistically that the UK is on the right path is doing it, incentivises you to say, well, we can we can carry on. We can keep moving in the right direction. So I think maybe that was it was a graph that I think maybe it was one of the CCC's graphs that sort of showed that this had actually happened uh, and that it was possible. Give us your in bullet point form, your takeaway, key, key messages from your findings in your report. So in terms of bullet point, uh, net zero is the opportunity uh, of this century, uh, potentially a trillion pounds worth of inward investment to come into the UK by 2035 if we want it. Uh, in terms of then the long term commitment to net zero, we need certainty, clarity, consistency and continuity. The four C's that we identify as part of a mission based approach 
uh, 10 10 year missions uh, to deliver on that long term uh, program. And then when it comes to looking at delivering on net zero, understanding how we can build out the capability, the capacity, the grid, the infrastructure, understanding that we've got to set out a roadmap uh, towards delivery. Because if we're going to be serious about net zero, it's not just about words on a page. It's not just about making commitments. It's about working backwards and identifying roadmaps by which you can plot out here and now what needs to be achieved if we're going to succeed in the future. Chris Skidmore, thank you so much for joining us on Climate Perspectives. Really good to have your time. And thank you as well for all of those hours that you've put into trying to make our society and make the wider world a safer and cleaner place for us and future generations to live in. Thank you. Thank you very much.